So that was a great talk. I, I, you know, I hope everyone ag agrees. This was, you know, very inspirational. Um, we're also very lucky uh, to have Michael Khan here today. Um, luckily for us, um, you know, some of his family moved to New Zealand. So for him to come <laughs> to visit us to Melbourne, uh, it's a, just a, a short hop across the Tasman Sea rather than a long haul flight from the US. Um, and I think it's a great segue uh, from the previous talk because when Chris was describing all these amazing things that are uh, possible, um, I keep thinking about the, you know, the uh, huge amount of work that needs to happen around that learning health system in terms of data infrastructure, in terms of knowledge, and Michael has been uh, working precisely in this space, uh, so it helps us put everything also in the right context. Uh, so Michael Kahn is an emeritus professor of informatics and data science in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Center. His research interests include clinical data warehouses for both operational and retrospective research support and translational research informatics from both bench to bedside and bedside to community translational settings. Most recently, his research interests have focused on data quality assessment in large-scale distributed national comparative effectiveness research networks. He participates in multiple national EHR-based research data sharing networks that employ a wide variety of data sharing technologies and approaches. Um, and I have to say that Michael is one of these people that um, every time you're reading, you know, your inbox with new journals and you say, oh, this is just an amazing paper. And, you know, the likelihood that Michael ha wrote that is, you know, pretty high. Um, so uh, I wanted to thank uh, Michael to be, uh, for being here today. And please, um, a big applause to welcome him. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that introduction, thank you for having me. I appreciate being here. Um, I don't know if Chris and I got the same set of instructions or one of us is dyslexic, because my talk is extremely different than what you just heard. Because my talk is about sort of my personal journey through trying to make this stuff work. So it's a very personal talk. It's not really an organizational talk. And so I had to pare down the 110 slides all about me <laughs> to fit into 20 minutes. But again, this is about a personal journey rather than sort of some of our accomplishments. Um, so extremely different. I apologize if you were hoping for the other. So I've held many different roles. Uh, n most of them now are former, which is what it means to be emeritus, which gives me time to be the last one now, which is the Health Data Compass Data Dweeb. Um, so now I have gone from, in my PhD days, where I was building stuff and doing stuff, to the highest level of incompetency, where I was running huge programs, back down to now just being an incompetent programmer. Uh, and I've sort of gone the full circle uh, across that journey. So I'll share some of that with you, and just start first with where I sit in the landscape of health informatics, clinical informatics. Now, informatics as a field has done itself a very poor job of, of sort of differentiating itself. It has 17 different variations in the label of uh, what you are. Now, so you don't crink your neck. I'm going to turn that by 90 degrees. It is the same slide, so you can stop doing this. Uh, it's the same slide. Uh, and it shows sort of the spectrum of scale of informatics as a field uh, from genes all the way to populations. Uh, and I live, as uh, was suggested by Daniel, in the middle, in the data layer of that, of that stream. So it's called clinical research informatics is the, the formal label. It's different than clinical informatics, which is what you heard from, from Chris. And now, of course, digital health is the, even the broader term. I live in that infrastructure space where you can't do anything if you don't have the data. Uh, so, you know, it doesn't come magically, um, um, and that's the area that I live in. So this is how I heard the remit. Again, one of us either has dyslexia or we've got different remits, and that is to share your experiences and personal stories with implementing innovations that leverage this combination, this weird beast of academics uh, and the health delivery system programs. And a little bit about what worked. 
um, and a little bit of the arrows in the back, uh, back there. Again, this is my personal story. Um, it's probably as non-linear as all of your personal stories, as you're about to see. So we'll just go through sort of for the four, what I consider the four phases of my journey. Uh, comes with a lot of student loans. Um, first job at age 34. So I am a board, despite being in uh, pediatrics, I am a board certified internist. I'm an adult physician. And I understand, Chris, adults are not, uh, kids are not little adults. I get it. I, get, I heard that 17 times. I did a uh, two-year fellowship in health services research, which is where I got research design, methodology, basic biostatistics. And then, uh, you know, of course, unfortunately, in a linear sequence, nothing in parallel, nothing in twice at the same time. Got my t five and a half years to get my PhD in, in medical computer science out of UCSF, which is a joint program at that time with the Stanford. I actually did everything d down at the Stanford uh, AI lab, the uh, HPP lab uh, with Ed Feigenbaum and Ted Shortliff, um, doing uh, expert systems in oncology. First job, again, age 34, lots of, lots of student loans, was in Washington University in St. Louis, one of the top tier organizations uh, in medical research internal medicine, but also with appointments in computer science. Um, and here I built what then was the popular paradigm for AI, which was symbolic expert systems. I've built a family of expert systems in hospital-acquired infections. Uh, and we're going to go back to these systems in a second. Um, but there was a whole family of those. And at the same time, and this was key, same time I had a faculty appointment in the university, I had a paid appointment in the hospital system as the director of their advanced clinical systems. And so I had two reports. Um, and this was a multi-hospital where I built a multi my first uh, data repository that was dual use for clinical care and quality and research. It was a five-way partnership between the university and the hospital system and um, three major uh, um, industry partners. A lot of that was hurting a lot of cats. Uh, we'll hear a little bit more about that. I then left academics. Wash U did not know how to commercialize software at that time. They knew how to commercialize molecules. They knew how to commercialize hardware, but they had no concept of commercializing software. And so I left for um, hoping to, to have my uh, impact sort of broader than, than St. Louis. Two small startups companies, and then a lot experience at a large international uh, uh, co company. Returned back to informatics, and for reasons I'll only describe after my third beer, um, why I ended up uh, an internist, ended up in pediatrics. Um, I did, and at that point, I uh, again, once again, this dual role of having an appointment in the, in the health system, in this case, Children's Hospital, where I ran their research informatics, in addition to a role in the medical school um, uh, as faculty in pediatrics, but also I took a role uh, higher than that at the, at the uh, academic unit um, uh, for our, what's called our, our CTSA, our, our Clinical and Translational Institute. I took a role at our Personalized Medicine Institute and finally, sort of at the end, which I'll come back to, this large data research warehouse where we were combining genomic data with clinical data, with environmental data, with social determinants health data, uh, 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 called Health Data Compass. So here's our campus. Um, it's a one square mile, formerly was a military uh, hospital. Uh, we have our two major hospital systems here. We have the pediatric facility down on the lower right. We have the adult facility up there. Immediately contiguous, this is our uh, educational quad. So all the School of Medicine, School of Nursing, School of Dentistry, School of Allied Health sitting right there. Immediately adjacent to that is our research complex. So here's our wet labs and our dry labs. Everything's on the same square mile. We all can see each other, walk together. And then right off the horizon is where our commercial uh, and uh, tech transfer um, group is. So everybody's together, same one square mile. You just walk across. Sometimes it's snowing. That's a little bit more difficult. But um, we're all together. Now, the actual health system expands the entire state of Colorado and moves up uh, into other states, but this is the core. So again, here's my remit, and this is so what you're going to hear. Um, 
Doesn't look anything like what Chris was talking about, but this is. Yeah. Okay. All right. I did the right thing. Okay. Very good. So, in the 110 slide deck that you did not hear, I'm going to decide to focus mostly first on this family of expert systems. You'll hear just a little bit about the other two at the end, uh, but let's talk about these expert systems. This was a family of expert systems called Germ Watcher. Um, it initially started out as a student project, and they called it Pus Patrol. I didn't think that was a good name. <laughs> Do not have your students give your projects names. Pus Patrol did not work. It's germ Watcher. <laughs> and it was really identified as it was, for, it was first for this tracking of hospital infection outbreaks. And this was an incredibly important. So the point of this is that this project was hugely successful and it used basic technology, it used basic methods but it had tremendous people and a tremendous drive and it met a need. That's the point. People, you know, drive and a need. So here we had identified problem where, where um, you know, hospital infections caused incredible um, complications and cost and it was something that, that was important to the hospital. They had to report it and, and this was a project that was driving the nurses crazy. I'll show you in a second. It's all about people. Informatics, data health, you're really doing anything. It's all about the people. And so this shows the diversity of what had to happen to make this project work. So we had the medical informatics people in the middle. Some of these were those students that did PUS Patrol and they, they ended up hiring them to bring this to fruition. But you can see the long list, there's computer sciences. We had the hospital IT systems the people who really, really wanted this, the advocates, the QI infection control, microbiology, the data source, and then the infectious disease uh, SMEs, the main experts. So you know, it really took all of these people to make this work. It was a lot of, lot of leadership uh, getting the, herding the cats and getting them speaking one from one corner to the other corner, very different languages, very different motivations, very different ways in which they came to the table. It's all about people. So let's talk about what made it this project so incredibly successful. It, I should have retired after this project. I should have just stopped. <laughs> so, um, it was, so here was the uh, original system that we ultimately were able to help. There, this was no real-time stuff, no watches. No, I mean, if I take a look at the technology we used, it was Windows 3 that we were using for some of this stuff. But it was incredibly effective for 10 years. This project, this system was in, was in clinical play for 10 years. So a hospital database would we create a report at midnight every night. It would be waiting for the infection control nurses in the morning. Every morning they woke up and they had to look at, manually look up 300, 200 reports. They hated it. They had to sit there and look through 300. On Monday, they had Friday's report, Saturday's report, Sunday's report, and Monday's report to look at. And they couldn't get out of the their offices until, you know, hours into the day by the time they went through those reports about which ones were, were, were an issue and, and into their database. And what we did with this system, and I'm not going to go into the technology at all because this is not a, a talk about the informatics that's behind it. It's about the success of a project that used informatics technology. But the, the, the replacement with it, the, this, the expert systems that went in, took that 200 and made it 30. And they were 30 highly, highly uh, impactful reports. And they were in their office and out of their office on the floor, the way they were they wanted to be, you know, in you know, less than an hour instead of sitting there all, all morning long. And what the other thing you can see if you take a look at these two is it didn't change their workflow at all. It was the same workflow. It was just, you know, less than, you know, it, it was 10% of what they were doing, same workflow. Look, you know, they didn't need to go and do anything different. And you see also see, kind of spinning out the bottom, I did a ton of research. My area of my PhD was in temporal reasoning and temporal, temporal query languages, and we just had a heyday with this. We were doing temporal and spatial analysis about where was, you, you know, you really break out an infection about two, 48 hours after you're exposed. Well, you tend not to be where you were 48 hours, and so your exposure, you needed to run time and space backwards to find out where the patient was. So we did a ton of very interesting dweebish stuff. It was very dweebish, but, um, uh, but it was on top of something very useful. 
so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, we're in my doom. All right, so you know, the point of this is that, first of all, from the workflow perspective, looked the same, and then from the spinoff from the academics, you know, we had just an infrastructure to do a lot of academics. So here are some of the success points that I really think made this work. It had a measurable pain point. 200 became 30. Very easy to tell, you know, it was 200 yesterday, it's 30 today, no, no argument about it, that being useful. We made it so that it didn't change workflow. We made it, you know, the fact that the expert system was running in the background, they, they didn't see it. Um, uh, it. We had very motivated end users. They hated what they were doing, so that's always very nice. Um, and um, what we didn't realize at the time, because I'll go back to this, is that we can mod very easily modify it to hit the other f angles of infection control, a very small amount of changes. What it didn't have, it did not try to boil the ocean. It did not try to change the entire world of infection control and infectious disease in the hospital. It did not have the clinical interaction. We did not touch anything in the front end. We did not touch documentation. It didn't alter, it, it, didn't, it, ha it had very clear success metrics. Again, it didn't alter clinical interaction. I hope you see the model here. It didn't need to be 100% correct, and it didn't interact with clinical interaction. So, found if you move to the front, this, and, and this is actually an important point because I wanted to sort of back this up. As, you're, as we're thinking about opportunities, not every great opportunity needs to be right at the bedside, sitting there right in front of the patient. There are great opportunities to change sort of the value proposition for people and for healthcare that are not right in the, right the frontline clinical action. This was a back end process. And, you know, Karthik at, at Columbia also claims that their most impactful systems, in fact, are back end. They're not right at the pointy edge of clinical care. So, again, I mentioned that the, the fact that we did this one project, we were very easily able to sort of rip out the, the uh, knowledge base behind GermWatcher. GermAlert is, uh, was a modification that, that answered the question, Who's out there on the floor right now that I need to go up right now to make sure that they're in isolation? Because if they're not in isolation, they're at risk. So that was germ alert. Suspect wa was looking for multiple, uh, multiply resistant uh, antibio uh, antibiotic resistant organisms, reportable diseases of public health reporting. Very easy to make these four. And we won a Smithsonian Innovation Award that, from the Smithsonian um, uh, for this work. Now, the other sort of outcome of all this that we need to think about in terms of partnering with the health system was that this was, in fact, the first software-only patent that came, this says Washington University, it really should say Washington University School of Medicine, um, for the intellectual property. Uh, not this project, this is a related project in diabetes, also involving time and temporal trending, which is, again, my area that I was working in. But we were the first to get, sort of bring that idea to Washington University. It's an old idea now, but it wasn't then. Um, I, now, I, I have seven patents to my name. Um, uh, one uh, at Wash U, five in the commercial uh, sector, and then we just got one um, issued uh, in February uh, at the University of Colorado. So these activities generate real intellectual property that can, can be commercialized. Now, you know, we, uh, one of the challenges that Wendy asked me to talk about directly, or I guess Daniel asked me, to, is, is really crossing this academic clinical chasm, you know, the clinical health care delivery. How did, and then really the, the, the questions that need to be answered is, why do I need you, and what can you offer that I cannot do myself? And so these are sort of two key questions you've got to face when you're trying to bridge this, this, this chasm. And the academics, if you just think, think about the haves and have-nots, you know, have, you know, areas of specialized expertise and methodologies um, as evidenced here. You know, we know each other. We schmooze with each other. We go out drinking with each other. Uh, we say stupid things to each other. But you have the international networks of collaborators that you can pull from and learn from experiences and share at conferences. We have the best cheap labor you can buy, which is students. Um, and they, you know, they're too stupid to know what you can't do, and they go ahead and do it. That's great. That's really wonderful. It's really great. Um, they built the first system. 
Um, and then again, you have access to really early stage technologies that you might not have access to and that have been fully com um, commercialized. What, what academics need is real world access, real world environments, problems, and users. If you take a look at the health system side, they have all those. They got the real world, uh, more, than, more, than, more than one. Uh, and they really have you know, outstanding clinician scientists who are really uh, willing and able to sort of come to the table and provide their expertise. And what they need is the kind of things that uh, over in the academics, the specialized, I can't carry an FTE for this, this stuff because it's too specialized, but I really would like to have access to it when I need it, um, uh, skills and, 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 it, and especially evaluation methods. Really found that the healthcare organizations do not know how to evaluate. Uh, and this is, can be an expertise. All right. So where has this broken down? Where has this not gone so well, you know? Uh, and, and really, you hear, you know, I don't know if you hear the same here or not. They may hear different grumblings, but it's good to write them down. You know, who's complaining about who, uh, about what? And these are misaligned incentives in a lot of time. So the academics sort of say healthcare only cares about costs. They only care about buy, buying bright, shiny toys, or, you know, they only, you know, deploy it without knowing if it works. And the health system complains that the academics only care about grants and they only care about papers and they don't know anything about practical systems and, and you can read them, you can read them and you can probably add to your own list. Uh, and you know, they're all a little true, you know, there's no, there, there, you know, there's a grain of truth in all of these. And you just need to uh, realize that, you know, you have to try to align these together. So it was important, very important. I could not be successful if I did not have these joint support mints. I had to have skin in the game and my neck on the line for both of these groups. So I, at the university, I was a professor, I was a section head, I was a co-director for our personalized medicine. I could have put a couple of other ones in there. At the children's hospital, I ran their research informatics and at the adult side, I ran this data warehouse. And it's important because the joint appointments really, first of all, got rid of some of the, uh, in our institution, they're the hospital system and the university are separate. They're not like UCSF where they have one. And so really, and they really established financial and accountability hooks. They could really just kind of fire me. And I had two different performance reviews, budgets and you know, hiring and firing lines, including they could fire me. And so, you know, it's just important to acknowledge that, you know, the, the, the agendas and, and the priorities are not always in alignment. I mean, it's just the way it is. And there's certain parts, you know, where you, there's you could kind of analogies, but there are certain parts in which, you know, you just got to be careful. They don't align, you know. You don't want to go there. Uh, and that's just the way it is. All right. So what does Colorado do to support this kind of innovations that you're trying to do here? So I mentioned that the health system is a separate corporation than the university, that previously we had two very separate innovation centers. And the reason for that is that for the university really focused on early stage high risk technologies called CU Innovations, and the health system had, has a different called Care Innovations, and they were really interested in near final technologies that needed final polishing. They needed access to a, a, an environment that would then get finally polished. And now we have one. We have one center, works together, integrates their innovations together, and really carry the spectrum now across that whole, whole thing. The health system runs a virtual hospital, not unlike, not unlike the Validatron that, that, that has been built here uh, for real world testing and evaluation. It has our EMR in it, it has our data in it, it has, uh, it's instrumented, it's a full sort of virtual hospital. The university runs our evaluation center, I spelled it your way here in this slide, um, and uh, to be able to sort of do that evaluation piece that is greatly missing at the health system. And it also has entrepreneurial sessions to help our uh, faculty learn how to think entrepreneurialism. And both provide seed funding so they all have skin in the game. Now I'm going to pivot just a little bit away from my personal story to a couple of topics that I wanted to make sure that I got out there. So here, here's a sort of a non-presaged uh, um, pivot to a different topic, and that is the data side of all of this. If one thinks about what is the typical analytics foundry of, of most organizations, 
you get a slide that looks something like this, where at the very bottom in brown is just sort of the nuts and bolts IT systems. In green are sort of the enabling APIs and, 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 and capabilities there. And then up in blue and, uh, are, are the reporting uh, uh, and extraction things. Well, you know, the th issue is, is that that model, and I hate to say for all of our health systems folks out there, you know, we, people don't think we matter a whole lot. So here's one particular, this is Steve Schroeder showing that, you know, our health care system, 10% up there in 11, at 11 o'clock, 10% of what, uh, your health um, is, is related to um, uh, what we do and what how our intervention. And, and 35%, the, the Steve claims, or 30% is, is genes, and the rest is outside of our health system. The Canadians think a little bit more about the value of their health care system, whereas you know, Steve only thinks our health care gives 10%, Canadians give it 25% credit, um, less on the genes, but still less than half is due to uh, uh, these sorts of issues. The other half is all social determinants. It's all home, uh, it's all health, it's all, it's all environment, it's other stuff. So as you're thinking about the, the data environment that you're creating, and as you're building your data environment, you gotta think big, you gotta go big, and you gotta go diverse. This is a diagram from Griffin Weber, uh, Griffin Weber at uh, Harvard, really showing that, you know, for most of our lot f work, is only in that tiny little box that is this square. I'll do it here and then I'll do it there. This little box here is what we've been mostly been talking about. So it's this little box. Pardon me while I hike over here for a second. <laughs> this little box is what most of us talk about. But if you talk about sort of things that matter to patients' health and about wellness and the ability to respond and their resilience, it's all this other stuff too. And so, you know, there, and a lot of this stuff is now digital. It's accessible. And so this is where our, the project called Health Data Compass comes in to go after this kind of data plus the genomics. And so this is what we've built with this cloud-based research data warehouse. It was the first major um, research cloud, uh, uh, research data warehouse in Google where we moved the entire medical record. We moved our whole genomics line is now up, uh, and pipeline is now up, clinical genomics line is up, up there. And then we also have down below the arrows on the, on, on the left-hand side, we have data that's coming from our statewide system. So we have uh, um, uh, our statewide uh, all payers claims database. We have from our environmental health, we have, um, we, we live at altitude. So we're at mile high, mile high city. Many of our patients come from even higher. So altitude is an important uh, dimension uh, for us, especially if you're pregnant do not want to deliver at altitude. Um, uh, so we have a lot of weather and altitude data. We have social determinants of data uh, in there. Um, uh, and what you find is you, as you start to have more diversity of your data, you start to participate in these very large. So this database here is probably uh, in total, um, I don't know, maybe 10. 10 terabytes, something like that. It, it depends on when the genomic guys are doing their work. But it's somewhere between 10 and 15 terabytes of data now. Um, and what you find is sort of the more you've got, the more you can share, and the more you can participate, and the more you can sort of leverage efforts uh, across the nation. And now we participate in all these other data sharing networks because we now have this infrastructure and this data together. Next non sequitur, I apologize, but the second twist I wanted to make sure I got in there is if you're getting in this business and you're gonna to start to do knowledge-driven, data-driven, data, -driven, data uh, uh, healthcare changes, this is, comes from Wendy's old institution from long ago, um, um, and um, you have to think about knowledge management. So this is a slide, again, it's really ancient. It's from 2005, it's, it's Roberto Roja's work, um, and it's, 18 months, six quarters of work uh, on their knowledge management environment uh, at Utah. And what you can see as you go across in just you know, six quarters, the incredible explosion of the number of data artifact, uh, knowledge artifacts that they had put into the, into the LDS system here. And what you see 
is that over six quarters, there were 14,000 different elements that were put in there. Most people don't think about this and they don't plan for this and they don't put into place knowledge management um, and evaluation and systems. What he found is that you know, there are 27 different ways in which knowledge was presented and many of them underwent multiple revisions in just 18 months. So on average, three revisions but some of them are 14, you see 13, five, they have revisions in just six months, in 18 months. So incredible amount of time and attention, and this tends to be ignored as people start to get in this, they, you know, you get, you, you get seduced by the sexiness of the AI system. But you heard Chris talk about, you know, they wanted, they, they could, turn, for the x-rays, they could turn it off by November because, the, you know, the, the world had changed um, and, and it was no longer needed. So just a word, um, an agenda is think about knowledge management sort of as you get into this work. I think that's it. So that's my story. You know, hopefully you found something useful. If you did, reach out. If you didn't, at least thanks for listening. That's all I can ask. <laughs> <laughs>